Madam Clerk, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, before I do so, my apologies for the delayed uh, start to those that are uh, watching from home. This is the first live uh, meeting of council since March. We have relocated to the High Line Hall in Wellington in consideration of social distancing. Mm -hmm. And uh, our uh, tech proved somewhat finicky, but I would like to express the appreciation of, of council to our staff members who put this together. Uh, Trevor, the uh, CAO, and um, Madam Clerk. So thank you all very much. We'll begin this um, meeting of council by acknowledging that the county of Prince Edward is on traditional land that has been inhabited by indigenous peoples from the beginning. We thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this land. Today, the county of Prince Edward is still home to many First Nations and Métis people, and we are grateful to have an opportunity to meet here work and continue stewardship of this land. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us, um, albeit with a late start, and electronically for this meeting of council. Um, due to technical difficulties and connection delays at recent council meetings, council will begin meeting in a physically distant manner. To ensure that we are able to maintain a minimum of six feet distance between each other, we are located, as I mentioned, at the High Line Hall in Wellington and District Community Center. Although Council is meeting in person, the physical meetings are prohibited to the public at this time. It is necessary to maintain distancing and eliminate the gathering of large groups to protect staff, Council, and the public from the spread of COVID-19. Members of the public are still able to make deputations and comments to council electronically. I would also like to acknowledge that June is National Indigenous History Month, month and it is important for us uh, all to take time to recognize the history, heritage, and diversity of Indigenous communities in Canada. I'll be speaking more about this uh, shortly. Tonight's agenda lists all the items before council for consideration. The recommended motions on tonight's agenda are shown in boldface. Copies of the agenda have been posted on our website. This meeting is being live streamed and any participation in the meeting proceedings will become part of the public record. The recording from the meeting will be published on the county's website immediately and can be viewed by the selecting the streaming tab on the county's homepage at thecounty.ca. Under agenda item eight, I will be asking for comments from the audience. Members of the public who wish to provide comments at future meetings can do so by contacting clerks at pecounty.on.ca to register. The maximum time allotted for comments is 30 minutes. This evening we have uh, four, five people that are going to be um, making comments. Um, and their names will be included in the council minutes and form part of the public record posted to the county's website. We also have one deputation, and when the deputant speaks, please state your full name and address your comments to the chair. Following the deputation, there may be questions from members of council. Bylaws listed on this agenda provide the full force of law to decisions of council. Any matter decided today by either resolution or bylaw is final and cannot be revisited by council until four regular meetings have expired without a two-third majority vote. In terms of housekeeping, in the event of fire, please use applicable exits. And if um, everyone here could either turn off or mute their uh, cell phones. That will move us to the uh, confirmation of the agenda, if I can have a mover and a seconder, please. And because of the space here, need really high hands. Councillor Bailey, seconded by Councillor Roberts. All those in favor? And that carries. Moves us to disclosure of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Does anybody have anything to declare about anything on this evening's agenda? Seeing none, we will move to announcements. Does anybody have anything they would like to bring forward and announce? Seeing none, okay. I have um, 
some proclamations I would like to read. Uh, the first one is a proclamation um, to declare June 22nd to June 28th, 99.3 County FM Radiothon Week. And it reads as follows. Whereas the strength of our community depends on people from different geographies and interests coming together with a common Prince Edward County identity. And whereas 99.3 County FM, our community owned and operated volunteer driven radio station provides an essential service connecting the county with immediate information daily and in times of crisis. And whereas 99.3 County FM enhances the ability of other community organizations to deliver information to residents and visitors. And whereas 99.3 County FM, a not-for-profit organization, depends on the support of local residents and businesses to sustain and improve their services to the community. Now therefore, I, Steve Ferguson, Mayor of the Corporation of the County of Prince Edward, proclaim that the week of June 22nd to June 28th, 2020, be observed as 99.3 County FM week in the County of Prince Edward. I further urge all citizens and businesses to give this Radiothon 2020 campaign the greatest possible support so that 99.3 County FM can continue to play its role as the station that connects the county. And I think we all recognize how important County FM is. Second one is um, June is National Indigenous History Month, and June 21st um, is National Indigenous Peoples Day. So this proclamation recognizes both of those and reads as follows. Whereas in 2009, June was declared National Indigenous History Month by the passing of a unanimous motion of the House of Commons, and whereas recognizing National Indigenous History Month is an opportunity for citizens to learn more about the history of the indigenous peoples in Canada, the first peoples of Canada, and whereas in cooperation with indigenous peoples national organizations, the government of Canada designated June 21st as National Indigenous Peoples Day, and whereas June 21st was chosen because it corresponds to the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, and for generations, many indigenous peoples groups have celebrated their culture and heritage at this time of year. And whereas National Indigenous Peoples Day is a wonderful opportunity to become better acquainted with the cultural diversity of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and to discover the unique accomplishments of indigenous peoples. And whereas Prince Edward County is a community that celebrates its cultural diversity. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Steve Ferguson, do hereby proclaim June 2020 as National Indigenous History Month and June 21st, 2020 as National Indigenous Peoples Day in the County of Prince Edward. And I urge all residents to take this opportunity to celebrate and recognize the contributions of the Indigenous peoples of our communities. Um, I received a note from... Um, Chief R. Don Maracle of the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte, who thanks us for recognizing First Nations Peoples Day and um, the, uh, the month. And this was sent uh, yesterday. Um, Councillor Roberts now has something he wants to add concerning, um, concerning uh, national indigenous history, I think, generally. Councillor Roberts? I'll start. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, this is this month. This month of June uh, is National Indigenous History Month, and this past Sunday, as was noted, June 21st was National Indigenous Peoples Day. Importantly and justly, we have proclaimed this important month tonight, and we did it on June 23rd. So this also tells me that we haven't done all we can or could do, or could be doing, to celebrate contributions of indigenous peoples in Canada. Going forward and looking to June 2021, we need to do more in partnership with indigenous peoples so that their incredible history receives the full recognition it deserves. 
In the process of collaboratively creating events, memories, and activities which honored this rich past, we have an opportunity to learn, learn more about each other, and to bridge the solitudes that have divided us. Let's seek those opportunities in what remains of this month, in 2020, and the months leading to June 2021, to experience the important history of our close neighbors and commit ourselves to that collaborative process. Next month, July, with the help of staff, I hope to bring a motion before Council which delves deeper into that opportunity. But why? Because history isn't free. It's an inheritance that's been hard-earned by generations who have come before us. And it's our responsibility, I believe, as current stewards of that history, to reflect, to review, and to acknowledge our shared past on a continuous basis. And this is very challenging work. It's at this very moment as we try to listen and learn from each other about painful parts of our past and how we might work together to forge a new way forward that is respectful, inclusive, and demonstrates a great unshakable belief in each other. We have definitely inherit, inherited an imperfect past that we can't change. But we have a very profound moment right now to change the present and to change the future. Sure, if you watch or listen to the news, it would be perhaps only human to say that that might not be possible. <clears throat> but as a boxer, I boxed for three years. I was inspired by a guy named Muhammad Ali uh, about the word impossible. And Ali wasn't just an epic fighter in the ring. He also was an epic fighter for racial and religious freedoms back in the 1960s. And he said about the word impossible, and I quote, impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing." The end of the quote. So, viewed from the decades that have passed, many things once considered impossible have come to pass. And now I think, I believe, I think we probably believe, it's time to carry on this work and complete the task yet to be done, because change is possible. With this important Indigenous proclamation tonight, and with the year and years to come, Let's try and make a better history. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That will move us to item number six, adoption of minutes. Could I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? Councillor Margotson and Councillor Forrester, any comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? That carries. Moves us to uh, refer to my notes here. Um, deputations. And we have one, as I noted earlier. And this is Treat Hall, the chair of the not for profit housing corporation, who is going to address council regarding an update on the housing corporation's first year activities and business plan. And Hello. We're having a little technical difficulty, so I'm going to turn you around and you can keep talking this way, okay? Thank you. All right. There we go. Thank you. You've got 10 minutes. Okay. Well, Donna, thank you very much. Uh, Catalina, will I need to show the um, my deputation on, on, um, on Zoom? No treat. Council has your deputation in their okay. agenda package. All right, great. Uh, well, thank you uh, to councillors. I understand how uh, how much time stress you're under, and I want to respect that. So I want to get right to the point. Uh, the, um, uh, the sorry, I'm having some, there. My technical difficulties, I think, are over. Uh, I want to address two things. Uh, my presentation tonight is one of what uh, I hope will be twice annual presentations to council to keep you updated on the housing corporation. The last time uh, I was with you was in the first week or the second week of January. So here we are almost six months later. Uh, as I say, I'm gonna be very brief and focus on two key developments. The first is um, the a, a major milestone for us, the recruitment 
of a successful recruitment of a highly, highly qualified executive director. This has been one of the things that has, one of two things that has really stood in the way of progress and um, recruiting a, a, uh, an executive director has been our board's top priority since the start of February. Um, a very professional and thorough search was carried out with the support of Rob Lee, a county resident who's a retired executive recruiter, and uh, Shirley Van Steen and Diana Cooper, board members. Um, recruitment committee was set up, job description was developed, uh, local advertising and national advertising, which resulted in 50 responses to uh, two candidates interviewed, and then one was subject to extensive uh, reference checks, and then finally uh, made an offer. The whole process was slowed by the slowed but not halted by the pandemic. Uh, so, speaking to uh, Chuck uh, Charles, Chuck Dowdle will be our new executive director. He started his career in commercial banking, uh, so he has a very good understanding of the financial side of development. But has uh, an important part of his career. Uh, since moving to the not-for-profit sector has been in the field of affordable housing. Uh, ironically, he started sort of in our neck of the woods with PLAS uh, in, on the Napanee side. He was subsequently director of client services for, in effect, a provincial consulting organization that consults to 1,400 social housing, housing providers on how to use their resources uh, most efficiently. Um, Finally, on the affordable housing front, he ran, literally, as VP operations, he ran the Toronto Community Housing Corporation's housing operations. After Metro New York Housing Authority, the Toronto Community Housing Corporation is the second largest affordable housing organization in North America. And so this was, um, what would you say, uh, the big leagues, <laughs> very significant experience that he brings to, it brings to the party and has since, uh, since uh, worked in community services and currently as executive director of King Kingston Literacy and Skills, uh, similar to our, our, our learning center. The second thing I wanted to speak to was COVID-19. It slowed us down, but it didn't stop us as much as council. Uh, we were able to continue our board meetings via, via Zoom. Uh, in, in the bigger picture, the pande pandemic will definitely intensify the affordable housing issues that we've already experienced, certainly in terms of, the, uh, of incomes. Uh, the, uh, we also formed the board, established a COVID-19 response committee to investigate if there were any immediate actions we should be taking to help address uh, COVID-19. The committee's conclusion and the board's conclusion was rather than uh, attempting to find kind of uh, special programming to specifically address COVID-19, the most important thing that we could do would be to accelerate our current plans and move forward with uh, our affordable housing programs. Uh, we, along the way, we did interestingly find that there are social lenders who will heavily fund properties purchased to protect existing affordable housing and that's something we'll be, we'll be investigating further. Uh, on the positive side, uh, obviously COVID-19 taken overall is a catastrophe of the, you know, of the first order. That said, uh, on the there is one, one positive note that both the federal and provincial governments are discussing significantly increased funding for affordable housing with at least at this point in the discussion with uh, d uh, a specific amounts identified for rural areas. The big centers usually suck up all the affordable housing dollars. So this is very um, good news for us. So finally, to, uh, to summarize, uh, with the recruitment of a really top flight executive director, we're now well equipped to get on with it uh, in our mission as a property developer. The pandemic will obviously increase demand for affordable housing, but will also likely result in increased government funding. And the timely arrive, Chuck's timely arrival will mean that we are in a good position to capture our appropriate share of government affordable, uh, uh, 
affordable housing funding dollars, something we weren't able to do in the past. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I will ask if any members of council have any questions. Uh, Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And thanks, Tree, for your presentation. I just uh, was encouraged by one of your points about investigation showed there are social lenders who will heavily fund properties. Are you able to elaborate on that a little bit uh, for us just so we understand what, uh, what exactly that might be? Um, there are uh, social lenders whose focus uh, is on preserving uh, affordable housing rather than developing new affordable housing. And they will uh, put up funding to enable uh, organizations to finance the entirety of a purchase for, uh, for, for the protection of existing affordable housing. So uh, obviously uh, th this isn't something you enter into lightly, but um, it's, uh, uh, as soon as Chuck comes on board, uh, it's something we'll be uh, invest investigating further. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I treat. Oh, treat. Well, I can't see you, but I know you're there. <laughs> treat, we've had a couple of sort of semi-introductions, and thank you for this more formal introduction of the, execu the new executive director. My, my question is, what concrete changes or impact will this new executive director have on the work and mandate of the Affordable Housing Corporation, and when will we see that concrete impact? in those changes, please. Uh, Chuck, in my experience and based on his references, is um, what my dad would have called a ball of fire. And so I think I anticipate uh, he, he's got a list of about 40 community stakeholders, including every member of council. He's very consultative in style. And I anticipate that as soon as he's on board, if not before, he'll be in touch with individual members of council in order to, to get your views and feedback. Uh, the uh, affordable housing, uh, we don't have existing facilities. We're a property developer at this point in time. In the future, we could be an operator. Right now, we're a property developer. And the development of affordable housing is just as complicated as somebody putting in a subdivision. The scale might be smaller, but all the same issues are confronted as would confront a commercial developer, plus all of the all of the, the specifics of uh, the various government funding programs for affordable housing. And in this case, in Chuck, uh, I, I to be honest, um, I, I, I was a bit gobsmacked that we were able to attract a candidate of his stature uh, it, based on his knowledge and experience, I, we're in a position to move forward with development, but also uh, over the years, over the decades, he has extensive contacts uh, with funders at the federal and the provincial level at Connections. And uh, I think those will enable us, if nothing else, to be in the front ranks of uh, any, uh, any new monies for rural, uh, for rural Ontario. The, uh, the absence, let me turn it around the other way. What stood in the way of us uh, you know, putting shovels in the ground, delivering uh, kind of concrete progress, two things, land, that's not the topic of, of this presentation, and an executive director who is a pro in the business. And we now have the executive director in hand. Any other questions? Oh, Councillor Forrester. We didn't treat. It's uh, Jamie Forrest speaking. Do we have any idea or even ballpark when I, do you think we might see? Oh, do we have to? Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any idea when we might even be close to having a shovel ready project? Like are we one year, uh, two years, three years? The, it, the project will be uh, project completion for a multi-story, multi-residential development is three years in the making from the time you first you know first start to turn a shovel uh 
I anticipate, obviously, one of the discussions we've had with the municipality is in regard of the transfer of the arena lands. Due diligence, assuming that council approves the transfer of the arena lands, due diligence will start basically as soon as Chuck arrives. And provided that there are no unexpected surprises turn up, which we don't expect, but nevertheless, prudence says we should look for, then a first stage in the case of the arena lands won't be a shovel in the ground. It will be the demolition of the existing structure. So I anticipate there is no reason we shouldn't be able to complete due diligence within the next three months. Okay, I'll leave it with that for now. Thank you. Any other, any other questions? Okay, if I could have a mover question. Yes, question. Hi, Treat, it's Kate McNaughton. Hello, Kate. I, just based on something you said that, so you did say the demolition of the arena. So the question has come up before, can that building, the existing structure not be repurposed? That will be examined as part of the due diligence, in fact. So it's not off the table. The intention at present is that it should be demolished. I know that some members of the community have raised a question whether it shouldn't be repurposed. That's something which we'll attempt to take a look at during due diligence. Thank you. If we could have a mover and a seconder to receive the deputation, please. Councilor Harper, seconded by Councilor Roberts. If you could read that, please, Councilor Harper. Roberts motion that the deputation by Tree Hill, chair of the not-for-profit housing corporation regarding update on the housing corporation's first year activities and business plan be received. Thank you, all those in favor? And that carries. Thank you very much, Treat. Thank you. We'll move to item number eight, comments from the audience. And we have five listed. And Madam Clerk, are we, I'll turn this over to you. Are they going to be in the order that you presented them to me? Through your worship, if I may quickly, if I could get a couple minutes, we figured out a solution to be able to get the deputants, the comments from the audience on the screen. So if you could just announce a couple minutes and I'm gonna stop the Zoom and restart the Zoom on this computer to be able to see everybody. Okay, so we'll recess for five minutes. Yes, if that's okay with everybody. Okay, that okay with everybody? Okay. We'll recess for five minutes, not enough time for.
see me anymore. <laughs> and per the list I've got, so Kevin Lockwood is is first. Okay. Welcome, Kevin. Evening. I think we've I think we've got the glitches worked out. So <laughs> no problem. Thank Thank you for uh, for coming and and speaking to us. Just a reminder, you've got three minutes, and uh, right. followed by questions, possibly. I'm sorry. What was that last part? Just stay where you are in case there are questions from members of council. Sure. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. My name is Kevin Lockwood, and I'm the current chair of the Accessibility Advisory Com Committee. Uh, Ernie Marketson is the council member on our committee. I just wanted to provide my support for the latest terms of reference for our committee and to provide you with a quick update on the work we've engaged in. Um, I guess the most significant work we started occurred last December when we initiated our first ever survey to the public on accessibility and what issues and challenges people find within our community. There were 98 surveys that were completed. I'd say the top three items uh, revolved around physical barriers, transfer, transportation barriers, and economic barriers. Some notable things were like uh, people saying they want more accessible space at community events, um, or the sidewalks they find are a little uneven, or transportation options that are affordable. All that kind of stuff, uh, we got all of our information by January 31st. We will be preparing a summary with all the results and giving it to municipal staff. We intend to actually use that survey to help guide uh, the accessibility concerns that we should focus on. And I mean, I have to say that there really hasn't been a lot of attention paid to accessibility requirements within the community. Those requirements uh, around accessibility have been around since 2010, and most businesses are not conforming to the AODA, which is the general legislation around accessibility. Uh, everything related to like customer service, information, communications, physical spaces, and transportation. Um, people just aren't aware, uh, nor doing anything. So our group believes that education on accessibility is the best way to encourage businesses to take action, especially when they realize how easy it is to comply. Uh, that will be our next step in our plans for later this year. Uh, to educate business owners and connect with the chamber and various BIAs or business groups. COVID has unfortunately delayed this work and we're respectful of the time many businesses need to get back on track. Uh, in addition to the business sector, we will continue developing ongoing relationships with other community agencies like Community Living Tech and various seniors groups. And of course, we'll work with our municipal colleagues to bring items to your attention, provide advice on accessibility, uh, on site plans and help county staff apply with the AODA themselves. And I just wanna close by saying that there are a lot of people in our community that need more accessibility in their everyday lives. Uh, whether they're seniors or people with disabilities or people with mental health issues, our goal is to make progress year after year to make our community more accessible. So I just wanted to thank you for your time. I'm open to answer any of your questions. And I also just want to close by saying thank you for the work that you do. And please know that your hard work and dedication is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Let's see if there are any questions from members of council. Anybody have any questions for Kevin? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your have time a good night. and your consideration. No problem, thank you. So that will move us to Sandra Latchford. Uh, yes, I can. No, I have everything on, I think. No, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Sandy. Welcome. Nope. 
Can you hear me? Uh, no, I, you're very faint. Okay, thank you very much for coming and speaking to us. And just a reminder, although I know you know this, uh, you've got three minutes. Okay, okay thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to be speaking to you this evening. Um, as chair of the Cemetery Advisory Committee, I was invited to review the revised terms of reference for the committee and give feedback. Um, I found that they, they are well written. Uh, I think that the membership uh, that they have uh, listed as uh, who can be members is very representative of the public. I think they've clearly set out the roles and responsibilities of the members uh, and I'm quite sure this was not contained in previous uh, versions of the terms of reference and I think that it yeah, it's a very responsible um, a thing to do and makes it clear to the members that they do have uh, responsibilities and need to follow through. I'm also pleased to see that there can be working groups to look into individual areas uh, and bring back more information for our group. Uh, and I'm especially pleased to see that um, the clerk's office will be involved with us more directly as a group uh, so that we can have feedback right away uh, from uh, her office um, to make sure that we're staying on the uh, right track. I'm going to remind you that there are 80 cemeteries in Prince Edward County, approximately, and 53 of those are being managed by the municipality. So this advisory committee has a very big workload with 53 cemeteries. They range in size from some very small uh, pioneer cemeteries to uh, large cemeteries that are still very active in the internment and burial um, business. And, um, and I think we need a solid uh, group to work uh, on how we can manage these assets effectively and cost effectively and effectively in giving a service back to the community, uh, which uh, that's what we really are there to do. Uh, so I'm very pleased with this and I'm looking forward to working with the um, clerk's office and my committee members uh, to uh, be as helpful and uh, a cooperative with council as we can be to, to uh, really do a good job working with the cemeteries. If you have any questions. Yep. Thanks, Andy. Any questions of members of council? Seeing none, no. Thank you very oh. much for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Now we'll move to John Garside. Yes, I can. The video is on. It's the car. Is that you, John? Kind of a whole thing. It is. Look. It's my COVID 19 haircut is not worthy. So is that the video? Okay. Well, then wh why don't you go ahead, John? Welcome, and you've got three minutes. Oh, very good. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I thank you for the uh, uh, opportunity to uh, uh, hear a bit of an echo. Hmm, okay. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity uh, to comment on the proposed terms of reference for the Prince Edward Museum Advisory Committee. I feel the revision the terms of reference is a good sound working document, a good structure for the committee to work with both today and moving forward into the future. And I think it's a very a job very well done. And I thank you for the opportunity to provide this input. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Just stay put for a minute. We'll see if there are any questions of members of council. Anybody? Nope, seeing none. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Do take care.
You too. Next is Elspeth Thumville, Chair of the Friends of Wellington Heritage Museum. Very much just to stay put for a minute. We'll see if there are any questions, members of council. Hi, Elizabeth. Could you just, yeah, mute your YouTube? Thank you. Hi, Elspeth. Welcome. Here. Can you see me and hear me? We can see you and we can hear you. And uh, welcome. And you've got three minutes. Thank you. Uh, well, good evening, Your Worship and County Council. My name is Elsa Donville, and I'm the chair of the Friends of the Wellington Heritage Museum. And on behalf of our group, I'd like to voice our support for the revisions being made to the proposed terms of reference for the uh, Museum Advisory Committee. Uh, as I'll expand on in a moment, can you see me? Uh, we can see yep. you. Uh, ours is a large and very active group. We've already spent Thank a number you. of years fundraising significant amounts of money for the site, and uh, we have some big goals ahead. And I should Elspeth, just say, I'm Elspeth, getting a tremendous act up. I'll just stop you right there before you continue. Could you mute your YouTube? Okay. Museum Advisory Committee. There we go. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Now we can hear you perfectly. Okay. Shall I carry on where I was or begin again? You carry on, yeah. Okay. So we thought that having these improved lines of communication would allow us to keep the advisory committee uh, better informed and by extension uh, to you on the council since our reports will be available to you through the advisory committee minutes. So it also would give us, in addition to that, a great way to let you know about some of the special and larger scale projects that uh, we'll be working to implement in the future. So I just wanted to know, I know several of you on council are familiar with the, the museum and you've been very supportive, um, but for those of you who aren't so familiar with it and all the work your friends do, I just wanted to take a very quick opportunity to give you a little bit of background. The museum, as you probably know, is located just steps from the principal intersection in Wellington. So very close to key businesses and services. And it's right in the heart of our village in a number of ways. Last year, to further expand the potential of the site and to provide more public space in the village, the Friends fundraised to transform the empty back lawn into a beautiful heritage garden, complete with fully accessible walkways, an entertainment pad, a number of benches, and the benches are um, modeled on a very unique local Quaker design. The Quaker connection is important because this uh, was the village's Quaker meeting house right into the early 1960s. The property was gifted to the village of Wellington on the understanding that it would operate as a local history museum in perpetuity. So its ongoing role as meeting place is very appropriate. Since we officially opened the garden last summer, which a number of you here tonight supported, and thank you again for that, um, the garden has become home to art classes and musical performances such as the Water Festival. It's been rented out for birthday parties and interest has been expressed in using it as a venue for weddings. So it's a popular site. Uh, the building has a very simple opal and open interior, which is currently used only for exhibition, but it would be really ideal for a wide variety of other functions and events for the community. And to that end, our hope is to remove a small non-bearing partition wall that currently divides the main space into two. When it's returned to being one large open space, exhibits could be displayed both on the walls and in mobile display cases that could easily be put aside uh, when we want to make it available for other purposes like um, lectures, screenings, uh, public events of all, all kinds. So it's a very beautiful space. Front foyer, as you might know, is already home to um, an official county tourist information hotspot, which has been very successful. So it's a site that's very well integrated into the village. And finally, just a little bit about our group. Uh, the Friends, we have 22 very active members, uh, plus quite a number of other Wellingtonians on the periphery who help us when asked. And thanks to the influx of young, energetic uh, people, engaged people to this part of the county, uh, we have the happy problem of scheduling volunteer meetings around childcare commitments. So it's a really great group. 
Our fundraising efforts have paid off, as you can see um, from the significant amount of money that citizens and businesses in Wellington have donated towards our projects. They, do they donated almost $70,000 just garden transformation. Um, but we also rely on a wide group of Wellingtonians to help us. And um, just quickly to give you a sense of that, the scale of that commitment, in 2019, they gave 700 hours of their time. In 2018, 1,315, 778 the year before, and 1,200 hours the year before that. So the Friends clearly take great pride in this museum and feel invested in maintaining it and growing it. And these revisions to the term of reference that you'll be voting on, I think will certainly help keep all of you in the loop um, as we continue to grow and develop the site. And we hope to see you soon in our museum. And thank you for your time tonight. Thank you very much, Elspeth. Let me see if there are any questions for members of council. Anybody? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much. Taking time thank and you. coming out. And that moves us finally to Jim Plomer. Through your worship, I received confirmation that Jim will no longer be providing a comment from the audience. He will not be? Okay. So we like to have a mover and a seconder to receive the four comments. Councillor Maynard, seconded by Councillor McNaughton. All those in favor? That carries. Thank you. And moves us to uh, item 9, 9.1, under items for consideration, report, report of the clerk's office dated June 21st. So if we could um, have a mover and a seconder to put this on the floor. Councillor Margotson, seconded by Councillor Bailey. Councillor Margotson, if you... So Margotson Bailey motion that report CL-06 slash 2020 of the clerk's office be received for information. And two, that the proposed terms of reference for the Pr County of Prince Edward Cemetery Advisory Committee be approved. Three, that the proposed terms of reference for the County of Prince Edward Museum Advisory Committee be approved. Four, that the proposed terms of reference for the Accessibility Advisory Committee be approved. Five, that the proposed terms of reference for the Traffic Advisory Committee be approved. And six, that bylaws for each terms of reference be brought forward to the July 7th, 2020 Council meeting to be enacted. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none. Okay, all those in favor? Did you have a question, Councillor Harper? I did, you just, a, okay, just a quick ahead. one, yeah, thank you. On the um, traffic advisory, just uh, looks great. I just, on the membership, I just wanna make sure I understand who's on there. So there's three members of council and two public representatives, and uh, I'm assuming John Hatch again. Um, there's staff members still on that as well? There's not, no more staff. Madam Clerk? Through your worship, if I may. Um, so staff were on there as members to sort of help the committee uh, move through items and at points, I know it was chaired by uh, Andy Harrison, and that is not um, typical practice in the municipal sector. Uh, staff will still be there as subject matter experts and support the committee with the technical reports, but they will not be actual members on the committee as that's a conflict. So Very good. we've changed that and now we'll have two public members. So members of the public will have a chance to understand and learn all about traffic. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Nyman? Is it on? Yep. Um, so I just have a question then uh, would be, so the traffic committee, we're not gonna meet then uh, as we were. So when are we putting, replacing with the members of the public? And when can we start having meetings again? Through your worship, as soon as the term, 
as soon as the terms of references are approved, we will do recruitment for the public to gain, uh, to recruit for two public members, and then the committee will will set up a meeting with the committee by the end of July, as soon as recruitment um, is completed. We also do have to do recruitment as well um, for heritage, uh, so we will do the efforts um, all at the same time to be more efficient. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we'll take the vote. All those in favor? And that carries. Thank you. Moves us to item 9.2, report of the fire department. Um, the, uh, concerning the pumper truck, if we can have a mover and a seconder for this, please. Put it on the floor. <coughs> Councillor Maynard, seconded by Councillor St. Jean. I'll read this. for information that the RFP 2020 CFS 12 be awarded to dependable emergency vehicles in the amount of 395,700 plus applicable taxes that a bylaw to be authorized sorry to authorize the execution of an agreement between the County of Prince Edward and dependable emergency vehicles be enacted at the July 7th 2020 meeting and that council approve an additional $5,665 to be funded from the reserve for fire equipment. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm not going to support making this purchase at this time. Council may recall that during our budget discussions in um, uh, January, February, um, I oppose this on the basis that we, we need to be changing, in my view, our philosophy on replacement of, of, of fire vehicles to look instead of just at the age, at their actual you know, condition, capability, functionality, and so on. So um, once again, the Wellington pumper is before us, and, and I think this is not the time to do this. But what I would do, since I was advised today by the Director of Finance that we are going to be receiving for our consideration a report on the fire fleet sometime in July. And I'll look to the CAO to confirm that. If that's the case, then I would suggest that we defer consideration of this expenditure until we've had a chance to look at that fleet report. Thank you. Okay. Is it Madam CAO? Uh, through your worship so just to clarify um, we are hoping in July to bring forward a report on the fleet but that is not uh, the fire department uh, fleet and equipment it's uh, all of the other um, operational uh, cars and trucks part of our fleet machinery so um, that that is part of a series of conversations we're bringing to council to support asset management planning we had brought roads uh, forward in March we got a little waylaid with COVID-19 but uh, we're bringing fleet forward and you'll see other uh, reports coming in the in the coming weeks but uh, fire is not one of them because fire department is actually probably the one area where we have a functioning asset management plan with a multi-year um, strategy for um, when we renew trucks I, I take your point council Hirsch about the um, criteria that may go into that but that is um, uh, a report that we will bring to council but is not um, on our short list this this expenditure is pr uh, recommended now because it would be it takes uh, several months for it to be um, constructed and and delivered and so we expect that this would be a 2021 uh, impact to our cash flow and was approved as part of uh, this year's budget so uh, moving forward allows that to be ready for next year follow up Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Follow-up, yes. Well, given that clarification then, um, perhaps I should give further explanation as to why I think we should not do this right now. As, as the CEO indicated, we do have in place an asset management plan for the fire department, which was worked out between the chief and, um, and I, I know the director of finance was involved, and it's a very fine plan um, and has, has worked well, except that it seems to have been based on this concept that once a large piece of equipment 
becomes 20 years old and there is that insurance consideration that that's the time to replace it. What I'd like to do is find a way to free up $395,700 this year to help us with our cash situation and not return this money to the, um, the fire reserve fund and instead have a new look at that asset management plan from the point of view, not of age, but of capability and functionality and so on, as I mentioned before. So my idea then would be to not make this purchase now, revisit that asset management plan and, um, and try to free up this cash. Thank you. Okay, Madam CAO. Uh, through your worship, I only stress this to be clear, the, uh, we are not spending money this year. Uh, you, you can, uh, wherever council lands with a decision on this uh, will have no impact to our cash flow. This was going to, this was budgeted money from a capital plan for this year that would um, uh, uh, can commit those funds, but they would not actually be spent until 2021. We do not pay for the truck until we get the truck, and we're not going to get the truck until 2021. I believe the chief probably has more details as to when we might see the truck, but it, regardless of your decision tonight, it, this money cannot go to anything else. It won't help us this year. As it, it, according to the report, it's 330, 330 days to deliver the vehicle, I think is what the, the report states. So that's well into 2021. Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, well, we discussed this uh, at length during budget, and uh, my preference would be to uh, to stick to the asset management plan and not to uh, deviate at this uh, at this time. It will be over a year, be or nearly a year, by the time we receive this new truck. Um, question through you uh, to our CAO: If we um, if we scuttle this now, I'm assuming then that we would have to uh, retender at some point in the future and likely expect uh, additional costs, and that will follow. I'm CEO. Uh, through you, Your Worship, so uh, yes, the costs, I believe, as outlined in the Fire Chief's report, it, uh, show that the costs have increased um, uh, as a result of the delay in um, uh, procuring this because costs just naturally go up over time for these kinds of things. I would also say that uh, there's a, a potential uh, challenge we will have in getting uh, good bids from the sector if we are um, known as a municipality that tenders but does not issue. So this would be, if we say no tonight, this would be the second time that we've put out a tender for the same vehicle and not moved forward. It's a, a lot of work for the companies that put in the bid, so uh, there could be some reputational damage if we if we don't move forward and and uh, and probably requires a, um, another look at how we're dealing with things before we would try to retender again. Do you could, have a follow-up? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll just say that uh, from my experience, probably the two most uh, important things to the public are uh, public safety and roads, and I think that this is probably the wrong way to try and um, reallocate money. I mean, the money should be and will stay in the in the reserve, we've delayed this uh, purchase once already. And uh, just to remind council that there is a uh, hand-me-down system in the fire department so that uh, that the truck that is being, um, that this one is replacing will be used in a, another in another fire hall. So I would strongly encourage uh, my council members to, uh, to approve this as uh, discussed in the budget. Council Roberts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, through you. Um, <clears throat> I think a bunch of us around the horseshoe have said a few times in different meetings and budget-related meetings that we lament the existence of a comprehensive asset management plan and that the fire department is the only one that actually has an asset management plan, and it's an excellent one if excellence is reflected in being fully funded, being multi-year, and doing what it should. So, you know, I think you generally tend to lead with your strengths, and uh, and I would support this staff recommendation. It's budgeted, it's a public safety priority, and if we don't do it, we're def we're deferring a rising cost into the future. 
Thanks. Okay. Councillor Bailey. Am I on, Trevor? Yep, I am. Um, sorry. Regardless of whether we buy the truck, on page 77, I've got a paragraph that states another factor to possibly consider is the Wellington Station. The implication is that with a bigger truck, uh, the garage doors might not be the right size. Do we anticipate needing to reno the Wellington Station or build a bigger one for the sake of bigger trucks coming? Don't know if the CAO wants that or Scott. Is that to uh, Chief Manlow? Can Chief Manlow hear us? Can you hear us, Chief? Hi, Chief. And there was that insurance consideration that that's the time to replace it. <laughs> what I'd like to dollars this year to help us with our cash situation and not return this money to could you hit pause on the YouTube <laughs> chief man low Chief. Instead, have a new look at that asset management plan from the point of view, not of age. But Chief, of could you turn off your YouTube? As I mentioned before, so my idea is purchase now, revisit that asset management plan, and, um, and try to free up this cash. Well, now we know it's very delayed. MCM. <coughs> Beautiful. Is, can he not hear us? Okay, so should we have Hello? that question again to the chief because it's likely he didn't hear it. Councillor Bailey? Scott, it's Stuart Bailey. Can you hear me? Okay. Hello? Scott, it's Stuart Bailey. Can you hear me? Hello? No. He cannot hear us. Is, is it sound That's correct. I'm on my cell phone. I can hear you that, but I can't hear. I was following along on... on uh, yeah. Okay, so so the question, we'll just, what, do you want to repeat the question? Yeah, read the last Councillor Bailey question. Scott, I'm going, to, I'm going to abbreviate the question. If you get a bigger fire truck for Wellington, there's a suggestion in here that the building might not be big enough for larger trucks. Are we going to need to renovate the Wellington station, as in put in bigger doors, or even perhaps build a bigger station? I, I, he asked, I could hear about the bigger trucks. Um, the, we cannot renovate the current station. Uh, it, it's not uh, permittable to do that. It would be too awkward to go any further. <laughs> so the response. Is Am I doing something wrong with this? No, we don't understand why the So basically the question is, if we buy a bigger truck, does that necessitate us to build a bigger station? No. 
No. If we buy the truck now, it'll fit in this design to fit into the hall. The statement in the report was if we wait another two years as the vehicles get bigger, that could be a challenge to put it in the current station as it is. Okay. It doesn't say that, but that's all right. Thank you. Councilor Margotson. Yeah. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm interested that we will diminish our aspects to be able to purchase a new vehicle by rejecting this tender. And I wondered why we tendered twice. Because we were supposed to buy this vehicle last year, I believe, and we didn't approve it in the 2019 budget. So I wasn't clear why we tendered it twice or that we would have an issue if we re-tendered. But my real question is a little further up on, I've heard that the asset management plan is excellent and that we have the money to spend. And when was the asset management plan completed? And further to Councilor Hirsch's question, should we be updating the asset management plan to see if the conditions under which it was created are different now in terms of the replacement times, the number of calls we get? And I asked this to some other councillors today because there is an overall master fire plan, I believe, that I don't think I haven't ever seen. This would speak further to all the assets of the fire department and whether we should be resetting that. So I see the difficulty in buying the truck if we have a reasonable product that we're already using. So I'm putting it in the context of do we need to update our asset management plan and all our fire asset as far as a number of stations. So do you know when the plan was developed? So through your worship to Councillor Margotson, I would say first a couple of things. The reason we had to re-tender is tenders expire. So too much time had passed and that's why we had to put it out for tender after it had been rejected before. But in terms of the asset management plan, could it be revived and improved on? Absolutely. All of our asset management could work. Has Council ever seen some of the detail? Probably not because we have a very immature asset management plan corporately. And so the plan has been to bring, as we talked about at budget, the plan is to bring asset class by asset class back to Council. You better understand what criteria goes into those decisions. You provide guidance and direction in terms of how we govern those assets and then we build plans accordingly. I would just suggest that we are in this situation with all of our assets across the board and that's not unique to Prince Edward County. Many municipalities, particularly smaller municipalities, are in the same situation. That's why the provincial government mandated asset management planning in the first place. But I'm not sure that I would say that we shouldn't spend money on a fire truck because we don't have a perfectly updated plan. We have been in a situation where we've bought other fleet vehicles and other materials in some of our other asset classes without having done that asset management homework either. So that is why we bring this forward today. Thank you. Okay, so I follow up. So we're committing to updating that plan in due time before we get to another significant purchase, I think is what I gathered from what you're, or we're hoping to. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Councilor St. Jean? You're on. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. Not so much a question, a statement that I concur with Councilor Roberts and Councilor Maynard. We, I'm going to back up a step. I was disappointed last year in the fact that for 2019 we approved a purchase, a capital purchase for vital equipment in our municipality. And then we turned around and we denied the, or turned down the original tender. We then had to re-tender. We, sorry, after 
we approved it again in the 2020 budget. This is not a good situation to put this municipality's reputation in to ask for tenders, turn around and say, oh, sorry, we changed our minds. Um, I, I strongly urge council members to move on with this, make this purchase. We're not simply replacing one, we're actually replacing this one as a, as a, and handing it down to another hall with a fire truck that's in 27 years old, I believe. So we're handing, me, handing down a 21-year-old to a 27-year-old, which, what are we gonna get? $3,000 for that old 27-year-old fire truck? Look, th this is very much a smart asset management plan. It's the only one we have. It's been working, and I get that council members uh, don't like seeing $400,000 purchases. Though that's a big ticket, that's a house. But you know what? We owe it to the people of Prince Edward County to ensure that they have proper fire protection. Mm -hmm. We have an asset management plan. We have experienced staff who evaluate all of that equipment and, and make those key decisions. And they don't make those recommendations lightly. Uh, so I, 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 once again, I urge every council member here, think about it. We need to move forward on this. And not one of us in this room is an expert on fire equipment. We need to rely on our in-house rec experts. There's one of them right there on the screen and I trust that man's opinion. Thank you. Okay. Any other, any other questions before I call the vote? I will also say that just to follow up on Councillor St. Jean, that we've, we've seen instances where we have um, you know, delayed purchases and the net effect is the cost goes up either the exchange rate or the, um, you know, the material cost or something else. So we, we need to be mindful of, of that impact of these delays. So I, oh, I will call the uh, vote, the motions on the floor. Okay, <laughs> okay. Councillor St. Jean has called for a recorded vote. Councillor St. Jean? In favor of. Councillor Bailey? In favor of. Councillor Bolick? In favor of. Councillor Forrester? Opposed to. Councillor Harper? In favor of. Councillor Hirsch? Opposed to. Councillor McNaughton? Opposed to. Councillor Margotson? Opposed. Councillor Maynard? In favor of. Councillor McMahon? In favor of. Councillor Nyman? Opposed to. Councillor Prinzen? Opposed to. Councillor Roberts? In favor. Mayor Ferguson? In favor. That carries eight to six. Thank you. This is to item 9.3. Report of the uh, Community Services Programs and Initiatives Department. We could have a mover and a seconder to put this on the floor, please. Councillor McNaughton, seconded by Councillor Harper. This is the McNaughton Harper motion that council receives, uh, hang on, CSP 34 2020 for information. Two, that council approve the facilitation of municipal COVID-19 community grant fund by the county foundation up to $68,600 from the 2020 community grants budget. Three, that council grant the Regent Theater $40,000 from the 2020 community grants budget. And four, that council transfer the remaining 2020 community grants balance of $45,000. Ah, I've lost my place. I just slid right out of my hands there. Um, uh, balance of $45,044 cash and $23,142 in kind to the 2021 community grants budget. Thank you. Questions? 
Anybody, Councillor Maynard? Thank you, Your Worship. Well, <clears throat> um, on, on the Regent Theatre, I would have been more than happy to uh, to forward the their request for the new equipment of eighteen thousand, but um, forty thousand, I'm not supportive of. I I don't think we've really seen the the effects on their overall budget. I mean, they probably. Uh, have, have lower operating, co they will have lower operating costs if they're not open. And I, for um, 12 years now, I've sat around this horseshoe where they are have been really close to being self-sufficient. It's not that I'm necessarily expecting them to be self-sufficient, but I think that the uh, the ask for the uh, capital equipment is reasonable. Um, so, yeah, I would, uh, I would change three, I guess, as an amendment to the, and I don't have the exact amount, but I know it was 18,000 and, and change for the uh, for the purchase of the capital equipment for the region theater. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll let other people speak and then we can. Yeah, I, I, I didn't hear what you. you well, it's, I, it's item three or, or clause three where it says uh, that grant the region theater 40,000 and I would change that to the figure of 18,000 some odd dollars that was requested for the capital purchase. Okay, well let's see what, what uh, others mm -hmm. have to say. Councillor McNaughton. Thank you. Um, so I, I am very happy with this report and I'm happy with the rec recommendation regarding the Regent. Um, so I was wondering, so the, I'm not quite sure how to word this. So what we're doing with the recommendation in, in this case of bringing forward some money for a second window uh, for grant applications, the, what was it, $68,000? Um, that amount, uh, is that going to, looking at organizations of significance in our region, and because uh, now operating funds are allowed within this window, can we conceive that considering there are already some other COVID um, funding opportunities through the United Way that all of our organizations of interest or significance are going to be able to uh, be accommodated if they're in jeopardy in particular, or is that, um, I'm just thinking in terms of the money that we're forwarding into next year. Is it possible to make that window open with the entire um, the entire purse, and then transfer the entire balance that is unused into 2021, uh, and not anticipate uh, moving that uh, that portion of the purse right now? Well, I think what. Correct me if I'm wrong, okay. Madam CAO. This is just an explanation of how the various funds are going to be directed, generally speaking, and the impact of that $40,000 on that. Right? We, I think the, the question, if I understand it correctly, is is that will that window reopen for other other applications? Well, I'm speaking to that. What the opportunity at that window? for that window is so that's so yes uh, okay but it, it, do you want to weigh in on this madam ceo because that that's really not what we're what we're trying to decide here well i think it is through the chair i'm i'm not totally sure i understand the question todd can you hear us oh please yes i can do, do you understand Councillor mcnaughton's question well, let me, I can clarify. Well, I, just let me see if I can clarify. Uh, Councilman McNaughton is asking if we can transfer the whole amount of remaining dollars in the community grants budget uh, to, the, to the second opening, uh, to the second window, and if, they, if there are any unused funds that they can then be transferred beyond that into the 2021 uh, community grants budget. Thank you, that's pretty much what I was asking. So, so the, I guess the, the answer to that is yes. 
concrete. Um, was there a particular reason why you recommended, why uh, your department recommended that specific amount to be forwarded to next year? Might sum it up even better. Uh, so to respond through the chair to Councillor McNaughton, we, we uh, in through conversations with the County Foundation, uh, we had some discussions about uh, uh, what we would, uh, what we could do with the funds. Uh, we anticipate that, or we have set aside uh, or recommended 68,600 from our budget, 5,000 would be contributed from the County Foundation to bring that figure to 736. Uh, and then whatever the balance that was remaining, the 45,000 we encouraged uh, to put to the 2021. But the, the, the option remains that if we go beyond, if we have, I mean, we, we open a window and we see what kind of applications come in, um, that would give us the opportunity to, to come back to council and say, listen, we've received more applications for funds uh, beyond uh, the $73,600 that we've earmarked and we would like to dip into those other funds and gives council the opportunity to then uh, bring those funds forward in this budget year uh, and or whatever it would, depending upon how many applications we get, if we didn't get uh, enough uh, applications. Now also remember that what we're proposing in terms of funding is not, not funding generally what we would fund through community grants uh, in this window but more operating fee funds for organizations that slipped through the cracks, were unable to access United Way funds or any of the other funds that are available, uh, have been available uh, to the community uh, and putting a, a sort of an upper limit on what we would be granting. So we're not talking about, uh, I'll give you the example of the Region Theater. The original ask was for an engineering study. We, we're, we're more considering these funds uh, in a COVID re uh, response fashion, uh, which would go to operations, which we don't traditionally fund through community grants, and we would set an upper limit or a, a range between 2,500 and 5,000 for small community organizations to medium-sized community organizations, uh, give us the opportunity to fund about 32, in our estimation, about 32 groups looking for funds to stay operational uh, through this, this year. And is, um, follow up? Follow up. So, and is the... Uh, foundation confident that that amount is sufficient because at that time if we do transfer those funds forward I have a hard time imagining them being available again in this year we're, we're our conversations have got us to this this figure and, okay. and we're confident that we would be able to distribute seventy three thousand uh, dollars in the community this year um, you know, that being said, this year's applications for community grants generally was much greater than it has been in past years. Yes. Okay. Council uh, Forrest, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'd like to first point out that over the years, I've always supported the Region Theatre to some degree. I don't Both think the, you're being picked up by the mic. Okay. I uh, just like, can you hear me now? Yeah, I think well, so. over the years, I, I have supported financial support for the region theater to some degrees. I've done it personally on a personal level too, but also on my nine years of council, every year we've tried to wean back the region theater a little bit, with them promising us that at some point they would become self-efficient, but that has never quite happened. So here we are again. We're back at the trough with a much larger amount. And I, I guess I look at the town of Picton, which is sort of the hub of Prince Edward County, but we have three hubs in the town of Picton. We have the library coming to the trough, looking for more money. We have the old community center coming to the trough for more money. And now we have the Regent Theater again, all fighting to sort of be one of the hubs in the county. All of them at great, great expenses to taxpayers throughout the county who may or may not use this. So again, I just have some concerns, concerns putting this sort of money forward in a very difficult year when there's going to be many, many groups that are going to have difficult times, and yet we're committing this large of funds right now. So I would look a little more the committee maybe to the equipment, which uh, Councillor Maynard had pointed out, but there's no way in good conscience can I give this amount of money to one group right now when I know there will be many coming forth in the next year. So I won't be supporting that. I'm going to wait till I hear a little more, but 
I'm more looking at around the $20,000 mark that Councillor Maynard suggested. Okay. Uh, Councillor Hirsch. On the subject of the Regent, um, I, I fully support the ask for 40000 um, The Regent is needing to do something radically different than what they've ever done before. So this is not the usual ask of the Regent, and, and I agree with everybody that, you know, we're always trying to encourage the Regent Theatre to become self-sufficient. But in this special circumstance where they need to uh, seriously modify the way that programming is provided. There is this need for equipment, and I'm going back to Alexandra Say's uh, presentation to us a few weeks ago. There's more than just the equipment. There is a digital media coordinator who is a person they don't have now because they haven't been involved in digital media. There's computer software licenses and these kinds of things necessary so that this alternative method of production can be can be carried out. And for me, if this is going to keep the Regent alive until such time as things return to something resembling normal, um, then I think we need to do this and um, I fully support the 40,000. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harper. Councillor Hirsch. I sort of said exactly what I wanted to say, which is thinking back to Alexandra's talk, I know 40 seems like a big number and a big chunk of it is equipment, but I think her point too was that this isn't just for them, but it's equipment that, you know, the municipality in general can use, that other groups can use, and there's a lot of groups that are going to benefit from this and benefit from the staff who can help, uh, you know, run the equipment. So I'm in favor of the 40 going to the region. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have two questions. Um, well, I have one real question. But uh, the first one is that uh, I share the sentiments of other councillors who for, whether it's nine years or 12 years or 15 years, have seen the Regent kind of lurching through different moments of financial stress and, and needing some kind of uh, uh, strategy and uh, funding coming from, from the community and from the municipality. Um, but I support this. I support this. Uh, recommendation on the $40,000 uh, and I would I would urge uh, the board at the Regent and uh, some of the major stakeholders of the region to look at an, uh, some kind of multi-year well-structured minority private role private sector role in taking the region forward uh, in the future can I can I ask a question while I'm here yep yeah um, I'm concerned about the not-for-profits, volunteer groups and charities in Prince Edward County post-COVID. We did have, we have put in abeyance a mayor's economic recovery team, um, which was essentially uh, an accommodations um, restaurant, you know, for, for all the right reasons. But what came through time and time again when we reached out through MERT to the charitable, not-for-profit volunteer sector is they are heading for a really hard wall. And uh, the underpinning of our economic recovery post-COVID is highly dependent, in terms of a healthy community, highly dependent on those charities and not-for-profits. A rough back of the envelope, uh, scratching out the arithmetic, is we have roughly 17% of the population of the Quinty region and we have 40% of the charities and not-for-profits sustaining us. So uh, that translates into roughly 120 not-for-profits and charities. I mean, it's probably a ballpark number. So being able to fund and support 32 isn't the whole job. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Bailey. Thank you. I'm in favor of the 40. Um, one thing that I've been doing was I've been speaking with Alexandra about fundraising and a new way of thinking about fundraising. So she and I and a group of other people will be getting together in the near future to come up with different ways to look for sponsorship. And I don't mean going around the neighborhood and trying to get sponsors. I mean larger corporate sponsorship in order for them to get the funds that they need from people who can afford that sort of thing, the larger corporations. So again, I'm in favor of that. Hopefully other people will think toward how we can get more funds coming into these people. Thank you. Okay. 
Anybody else? Councilor Bolick. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. COVID has struck everybody, and we have a number, as Councillor Roberts has said, a number of nonprofits and charities throughout the county that are feeling this. And many of them uh, raise their funds, and they are self-sufficient, through things like fairs and other social get-togethers, which aren't happening for obvious reasons. A number of them have come to us and asked for things as simple as deferral of taxes. That's not possible unless you're a charity by law. So I think it's difficult to tell all of these small outfits who have never come to us before that, sorry, there's nothing for you, but we have $40,000 for someone who's been coming to us for 12 years. Sometimes we have to make tough decisions. And I think that's the difficulty. And how do we explain that to the rest of these organizations throughout the county? that there seems to be a favored few for whatever reason. And I think that's the conundrum that we have to face. And um, if we say that, you know, one organization gets funding every year just because, but you folks in your time of need, when you've always been responsible and self-sufficient, we have nothing for you. Thank you. Did I see Councillor St. Jean? Thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I too will be supporting this um, as, as uh, in the full amount of forty thousand dollars. I see this as not just a give; it's a, a a a voice of support. It's a it's an investment in our community. Uh, the Regent Theatre. When it's, uh, when it's operating, and in the past, you, there was a quantifiable amount of economic return for every dollar earned at the Regent Theatre and in the arts in general. Uh, when I was president of the Regent Theatre back in 1998, that factor was somewhere in the, in, uh, the order of seven to one. So for every dollar spent in that theatre, seven dollars was returned in economic uh, uh, an economic return in our community. So I see this as an investment, not a gift. Uh, they, they need to convert how they're doing their business to, to, and, and adapt to this new environment. And I'll tell you, I was impressed when I saw what, what it is they're trying to do. They're not just doing it on their own, they're partnering with others in the community. And I see this as a model for other not-for-profits uh, who may or may not be coming to ask for money uh, to to come with us come to us with a plan that makes sense that is broad ranging and 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 will have a larger effect on the entire community not just for your special cause and I say that as as also a treasurer of a not for profit in this community uh, you don't just go and ask for money because you want money prove to me that you deserve it and that you're going to do good with it. And I see that the Region Theatre will do good, not just for themselves, but for the entire community if we invest in them. So I will be supporting this. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor yes. Maynard. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, first, I have a, a question um, to our staff. Uh, so bullet number four, where it talks about uh, carrying over the... Um, the unused funds from 2020. Now that I believe these um, funds come from our operating budget, so how do we facilitate a carryover of operating funds? Because that's uh, that's not uh, that's not usually how we do things. Is that to whoever, CAO? whichever? I guess to the CA. Yes, to uh, to CAO. Ma'am CAO. Todd, can, can you hear the question? Just to clarify, the question was, how can we carry over funds from our operating budget? Yes, yes. Uh, so, I, I mean, I'm not the director of finance, but uh, I would anticipate uh, that any unused funds would be directed into a reserve that could then be, um, uh, which would then be uh, viewed as revenues for 
2021 with a with a compensatory uh, expenditure loan. Okay, and um, secondly, follow yeah, as a follow up, um, I see that the 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 not for profits, the service clubs, and the charities that aren't normally eligible or for for these particular grants and depend on fundraising that they have not been able to do. Are going to be the ones in the greatest in the greatest need this this year, and uh, we can't do it all, but we can maybe help everybody a little bit, which is why I thought that uh, you know twenty thousand to the Regent Theater to get them the necessary equipment to allow them to do business uh, as uh, as usual would be uh, would be appropriate. So. If I can get a seconder, I will put that uh, I'll put that amendment on the on the floor. Okay, but well let's let's see if anybody else has any other questions before we get to that. Did you have a question, Councilor McNaughton? Uh, no more comment. So there there are thank you there are alternatives that which could include um, including the entire amount for the for the granting window to make sure that everyone who needs to be accommodated is accommodated. So that's one alternative right off the bat. And I do see not giving them, um, I understand what a number of councillors have said about giving them the money for the equipment, but you do hamstring them to actually use the equipment if you don't give them uh, the support they need to uh, use the equipment. So you can't just have a bunch of equipment and no expertise and no program and no um, licenses to use the equipment and the software. Um, if you don't have the licenses and the staff. So that's just that one point. Okay, thank you. Councilor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, I think I'm just wondering, so the $40,000, um, and I thought I might have heard it mentioned here tonight, 20,000 of it was to, for, an employee is that or was the 40,000 all for the equipment and stuff to get going do you hear the question Todd uh, yeah through you the mayor to Councillor Nyman I believe the 40,000 wasn't just for the equipment it was to uh, uh, it was a portion of it was for an equipment purchase uh, a portion of it was to uh, have the uh, appropriate staff in place mm -hmm. to uh, operate the equipment and the licenses to do so um, is what I, is what I understand what the what the request was from the the uh, June 9th uh, deputation. So it's not just equipment. It is I guess the short answer. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Last question to you, Councillor Forrester, and then we'll move on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, question, Todd. And I guess asking Kate too, but what would they do if they don't get all this ball? Any good organization, you're asking for a certain amount, but I would like to think I have a backup plan if I don't get this certain amount. And Todd, I'm, I'm asking you, did you have any discussions? What do you absolutely need to have from us? What if you do not get the full amount and the council doesn't approve this? What is their backup plan? So, sorry, just to clarify, Councillor Forrester, through through the mayor, you're wondering what the backup plan is for the region if we don't give them the full amount? Exactly. Uh, well, uh, I'm not 100 percent sure what their what their plans are. They've identified that if they're pivoting in direction, uh, there's a cost to doing that, and they see that as the only viable alternative to staying uh, alive. I mean, I, I I would assume that uh, we could give them less money with less. Uh, based on less um, um, than pivoting. So we may, you know, there may be the opportunity to transfer uh, a smaller amount of funds that they could just use to maintain uh, their outstanding debt payments and keep their staff employed. Um, however, I, I believe what they've, what they've done is they've shown some, uh, some creative thinking in how they're reimagining how they're doing business and they, they see this as an amount that's required to, to move forward. The, the difference between what they request, so they requested uh, forty thousand uh, dollars, or I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, they had requested forty thousand dollars in the through the community grants process this year uh, when the process was actually happening. 
uh, to, to fund an engineering study. And, and the reason we decided, just to be clear, the reason why we, so the community found, uh, county foundation had uh, gone through their application and, and saw uh, an opportunity to give them 35, or they granted 35,000 for that study. Um, this is a different, this was, this request is different because it's representing a different ask. So we declined once they, even though they had been recommended by the county foundation, we view the opportunity to do an engineering study not being contingent on this year. And at the time when we were making the decision, we held back those funds uh, to reserve them for uh, this type of situation that we find ourselves in today. Uh, so um, the, what they've asked for this time, I believe uh, is what they require. I don't know what they're, to be quite honest, I don't know exactly what their uh, alternative plan is. I would assume that it would involve uh, whatever funds they could get uh, and to try and do some type of uh, funding appeal to the community in, in an effort to, to uh, stay financially uh, solvent. Uh, but I, I, it was a pretty, uh, I think Alexandra um, was very clear in her deputation on June 9th that it, this, the prognosis, if they don't uh, fund this pivot, is pretty bleak for them. Can I just have one more follow up, Mr. Follow up? Well, and again, this is a problem I get into. We do a study and we're not guaranteed, we still haven't been guaranteed the funds. I would like to think that I would have a backup plan after that. It's just something I would be doing. Okay. Madam CAO, you wanted to comment? Through, through the, your worship, I would just um, clarify uh, for the record, since I know you don't have the community, the um, Regents request in front of you. They asked for $40,634. 18000 of that was for streaming and video production equipment. 2600 was for computer and software licenses. Um, uh, 6000 was for online marketing. 4000 was for personal protection equipment, presumably uh, given our COVID context. Um, and $10,034 is for a digital media coordinator. Uh, I have been in conversation with Alexandra about uh, her ask um, after council. I, I would say that um, this is the, the best plan they have. This is the plan. Uh, and uh, they had emphasized the pressure they felt um, in terms of uh, September being their their breaking point. So whether or not all or part of this could be made up through another funding source or fundraising opportunities, I guess is the um, the other alternative they would have. But really, this is the this is the plan that they are moving forward as the uh, alternative to to save the theater from its uh, current financial strife. Okay, Councilor Prinzen, you'll have the last point, and then I've got something to say, and then we'll call the vote. As Madam CAO, and I just for for my own clarity, it says the digital media coordinators, 16 weeks are funded 100% by the Canada Summer Jobs. So is that federal, provincial, or are they? My question, I guess, point blank, is are they double dipping on us? No, I, I believe she spoke to this at the meeting. The federal program is only 16 weeks, so what they are trying to do is uh, take the position to the end of the calendar year to give them some time to find a way to fund that position more sustainably, but the, the, uh, the money is to continue that beyond um, to get them to the end of 2020 uh, when the federal program money would not be long enough. Okay, I just want to um, just make a, a, a couple of points. I don't want to repeat everything that's been, been said here, but I, I I will say I was particularly struck by Alexander's presentation and the thought that went into how the theater could pivot um, to, you know, address a post-COVID world, for lack of a better term, and to utilize technology that, in my memory, has never been talked about by anybody at the region before. She came forward with a a well thought out plan um, that that would accomplish a number of things: better utilization of the theater, involvement of community groups, 
um, uh, more involvement by the general public. I also think it's, they've got a, the new board chair was announced this week. I'm not sure if everybody got a message from Bob Thornton, um, who has, has joined and has taken the range. So there is new, there's new passion and enthusiasm at the, uh, at the region from, from what I've seen. I'd also like to suggest that uh, its position on Main Street, Picton, as a gathering place uh, for entertainment, for cultural events, and we've had everybody from David Frum in there. We've had we had our our, our own um, you know swearing in there. Uh, it it plays a pivotal role. I just can't imagine that place being dark. Uh, um, and what the effect of that might be to the, certainly Main Street, but also the economy of, of Picton and the, uh, the ability to, or the impact it may have on people that want to invest in, in this community in some way, shape, or form. And I think that's something that we have to bear in mind. So I'm, I'm supportive of, uh, of their ask. And I think that it, it's important for us to show that support and give them this shot. It's unknown when they will be able to um, um, get back to normal because of the provincial um, legislation and, and what we're dealing with COVID. Uh, but they could certainly start enacting some of these these plans if they uh, if they had this money. So I'm I'm fully supportive of it. But I also recognize that they the regent must understand that you know it's not a bottomless pit, mm -hmm. and that this you know if if this passes and we agree to it, that they've got to put the plans into place so that as Councillor Forrester. Uh, indicated they don't come back for more asks in the future. So that's my view. I think it's a very important uh, entity in Prince Edward County um, and really needs our support. Now, Councillor Maynard, do you want to move forward with, with something or what would you like so, to do? No, the, the, the motion, I believe, is on the floor, was seconded by, um, by Councillor Forrester to uh, amend the 40,000 to 20,000. No, I don't think it is on the floor. It, it did was, you put it, it on the floor? It was duly moved okay. and seconded. All right. Okay, so we'll vote on the, uh, the amendment. Do you want me to read that out loud? Sorry? Through your worship, would you like me to read the amendment out loud? I, I can read it if you'd like. Yeah. I, yeah. If someone can read it, I, can't, I couldn't hear you. So the... Um, it's uh, bullet number three would be changed to that council grant the Regent thousand twenty thousand the Regent Theater twenty thousand dollars from the twenty twenty community grants budget. Okay, so we're voting on that, Madam Clerk. Can it be a reporting vote? So recorded vote on the amendment yep. for 20,000. Councillor McNaughton. Uh, opposed to. Councillor Margetson. Opposed. Councillor Maynard. In favor of. Councillor McMahon. Opposed to. Councillor Nyman. Opposed to. Councillor Prinzen. In favor of. Councillor Roberts. Opposed. Councillor St. Jean. Opposed to. Councillor Bailey. Opposed to. Councillor Bolick. In favor of. Councillor Forrester. In favor of. Councillor Harper. Opposed to. Councillor Hirsch. Opposed to. Mayor Ferguson. Opposed to. And that loses 10 to 4. Okay, so we, now we vote on the original motion. 
Okay. I'm surprised at that, Councillor Forrester. And this is the entire motion, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Councillor Forrester. Opposed Councillor Harper. In favor of. Councillor Hirsch. In favor of. Councillor McNaughton. In favor of. Councillor Margetson. In favor of. Councillor Maynard. Opposed to. Councillor McMahon. In favor of. Councillor Nyman. In favor of. Councillor Prinzen. Opposed to. Councillor Roberts. In favor. Councillor St. Jean. In favor of. Councillor Bailey. In favor of. Councillor Bullock. Opposed to. Mayor Ferguson. In favor of. That carries 10 to 4. Okay, thank you. And moves us to item 9.4, uh, 9 point, change glasses. Uh, moves us to item 9.4, sorry. If you could have a mover and a seconder for this, please. Councillor Prinzen. Seconded by Councilor Nyman. Could read it, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a Prince and Nyman motion that the items approved under delegated authority to CAO during COVID 19 pandemic be received. Okay, thank you. Questions? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that carries. So on to 9.5. Are you sorry? I think we'll get through 9.5 and then we'll go through that. Um, can I have a mover and a seconder for this, please? Councillor McMahon, seconded by Councillor McNaughton. Was there a seconder? Me. Councillor McNaughton. Thank you, Your Worship. This is a McMahon McNaughton motion that uh, report CL 07 2020 of the clerk's office dated June 25th. Is that June 23rd or 25th? 23rd. Okay. Uh, 2020 be received for information. And number two, that the planning committee of the corporation of the county of Prince Edward be established. Three, that a bylaw for the terms of reference be brought forward to the July 7th, 2020 council meeting to be enacted. And that for the applicable administrative changes to bylaw 4402-2019, being the procedural bylaw be completed and brought forward to the July 7th, 2020 council meeting to be enacted. Okay, thank you. Questions? Questions? Okay, then I'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that, that carries. Thank you. So we are now two hours in, 10 minute um, recess, okay with everybody? Okay, so we'll recess for 10 minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Up and ready? Okay. All right, moves us to um, item 10, committee reports. And the first one, can we have a mover and a seconder for 10.1, please? Councillor Prinzen, seconded by Councillor Forrester. Could read. Mr. Mayor, it's a Prinzen Forrester motion that the public report of the closed session from the council meeting held on June 9th, 2020, be adopted as presented. Thank you. Questions, comments? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? Uh, that carries. Thank you. 10.2. Move her a seconder for that, please. Councillor Forrester, Councillor Bailey. Forrester Bailey motion to report of the Committee of the Whole from the meeting held on June 11, 2020, be adopted as presented. Thank you. All those in favor? 
Sorry, or sorry. Questions, comments, Councilor Nyman. Motion CW 097-2020. Okay. And what page is that on? 149. Okay. Can you repeat the motion? 097-2020. Yep. Okay. Anybody want else want to pull anything? Okay, so should we vote on the uh, the balance of this, Madam Clerk? What's your Madam Clerk? Could I have a seconder for that motion to yes. Councilor Margots? So the motion would be that the report of the Committee of the Whole from the meeting held on June 11th, 2020 be adopted as presented, save and accept motion CW-097-2020. Correct. Okay. All those in favor? That carries. So Councilor Nyman has pulled this item. Councilor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so when we had this discussion, I was having technical difficulties, I guess, because I didn't hear half the um, conversation that was going on. And I said I wanted, I had some questions on this and some um, uh, comments on it. So I'm just trying to find it here. So just from what I'm reading, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what we're trying to do is speed the process along. And what I'm getting is we'll delegate authority to staff and remove council and move things along. But I don't know that we're taking the right approach to this and don't take this the wrong way. But um, I know there's files that are two, three, four years that people are trying to get through that never came to council. And so the, I, I guess where's the slowdown, I guess, is what we're trying to figure out. Um, I've said, and I think a lot of council has said that if I'm going in to do, get something through planning, so I'm walking in, Brad, what do you need? Well, this is what I need. You had that initial meeting. You had the checklist. You send me away with the checklist. Don't come back until you got it all done. I go back, and then everything, you move forward. But what's been happening, and I've heard it loud and clear from other people, is we go in, we have the initial meeting. This is what we need. We go away. We get that completed. We come back. Oh, you need this. You go do that, come back. Oh, you have something else to do. And next thing you know, you start doing all this, and there's costs associated with it. And then sometimes there comes a time when people are so far in, they can't go back. And they, you know, they could have said at the start, well, if we know the cost was $50,000 to get us started, you know what, we're not going to do it. But they're so far in, they can't back out. The other part of it is, and we've asked this before, is we need a free fee structure for uh, developers coming in because while we're sitting here listening, we hear all the time that, well, we had a big development and, you know, we put a lot of time in it, staff has, but we're not getting nothing out of it. We haven't got paid for our time. And I thought we were going to get a report back stating that, that we were going to get that fee structure. And this is just my opinion, but I think what happens is we have a big developer, developer come in and everybody's eyes lights up and that's where all the time goes. And then the smaller people get pushed to the side. And it's nobody's fault, it's just that everybody gets wrapped up in that and all the time is used on the big stuff. 
and the smaller stuff gets put to the side. So I, I think this doesn't really address what the issue is, or what we've had. And I'd like to be able to have something that says that, that this is what we're addressing. And having that fee structure would go a long ways. So I guess, you know, maybe to Marcia, I guess, uh, mm. would be when do we expect to see that fee structure? Yeah, I think there's an operational consideration as to how the department works. Is what you're. Yep, so we'll let the CAO respond. It's through your worship to um, Councillor Nyman. So um, I, I will acknowledge that the um, delegation of authority in and of itself is not going to solve the problems that the counties had in terms of turning around applications. The report tried to outline a number of things that we're doing simultaneously to address things. The, the delegation of authority is trying to recognize some lessons we learned uh, through the exercise of delegation of authority in, uh, that was put in place as a result of the pandemic, that there's a bunch of um, legal or, or um, uh, important technical steps in the process that uh, that really hinge on uh, an abil a builder or developer to be able to um, unlock funds and move to the next step and those uh, are uh, we're recommending are not um, well suited to a council conversation in terms of advancing things forward which is what we uh, mimic the delegation of authority largely on. Um, so that's only one part of it. Uh, we think we've made some efficiencies under the pandemic and we'd like to continue in that um, direction. But in terms of uh, FASTER, uh, the lean exercise, which the report outlines is the first section of um, uh, internal process improvements. That was some technical work we did uh, within the department. Um, we had realized we've come to a place where um, a lot of time is spent with what I would call the tire kickers. And instead of um, becoming really clear with somebody, what is it that you need to proceed? Or if the project has a lot of concerns, how do we very quickly and clearly explain what else you need to do in order to move forward and not continually meet with the same people who have kind of some of the things they need, but not all of the things so that we can focus on the people who are ready and keep moving. Whether they are a small, you know, single homeowner who wants to do something simple or a, or a big developer who's shovel ready if we can just um, move forward. So a lot of uh, the process improvements that we've put in place now uh, starting in June have been related to the front end of the process, freeing up staff time so they spend less time um, talking about potential projects and meeting about potential projects or half done applications and whoa, and uh, more time um, uh, reviewing and, and uh, providing recommendations on finished projects. So we're already starting to see some successes in that area. We certainly need to complete that work and, and finish it. Uh, we're also uh, filling some staff vacancies that I think will um, uh, support that. And the reason we did not bring fees forward right now is that we, uh, we still have some more work to do in terms of improving and demonstrating demonstrating to the um, development sector that we can turn around applications and uh, files faster. If we can uh, show that in the technical review part of the process and not just at the upfront um, pre-consultation and inquiry stages, then I think that we have a more convincing case to go to the development community and say, this is the service you're going to get and therefore this is how much it costs. Right now we hear a lot of pushback that people don't want to pay higher service um, costs for bad service. They want better service and then they'd be willing to pay for it. So we think it would be a stronger um, case to bring back to council. It is our intention to bring back um, a revised fee structure before the next budget conversation. So before we do start the 2021 budget. Um, I think that answers the questions that I wrote, unless there's something else. Yeah. Um, no, I, if somebody else has some, I'll wait. Okay. Councilor Margitson. Thank you. Worship. Um, I want to also speak to CW-97-2020, specifically number two, being the bylaw that is presented tonight in order to consolidate planning delegation of powers and duties of council. And what I specifically thought that might 
the first recommendation I had was to expand slightly or add another provision for minor developments as it relates to delegated authority. And I'm proposing to expand delegated authority to site plan control processes included in or as a, or as a result of plans of subdivision or condominiums. And I've explained this to my colleagues that I felt that those types of higher density residential developments within plans of subdivision or condominiums go through extensive review as part of the whole draft plan process and um, do extensive background studies are, are submitted. So I'm hoping that one could be amended if I can get the support of council to include that one to make that part more efficient going forward. And my second recommendation was with the notwithstanding clause at the end. And I was proposing to include not just 1D, but all the provisions of one of this bylaw as matters that could be referred back or requested to be referred back to council. And I say this because I feel that any of the matters that are within the delegated authority could get to the point where a counselor or the applicant or, or the CAO um, director may want to have that heard before council. And I would hope that councillors would not look at this as a, a way to bring excessive issues forward and, and take them away from the delegated authority power, but I feel it does give us a more general uh, mechanism for those cases where it is important to bring them to, before council. So those are the two, two uh, amendments that I have proposed. And just on a general basis, I'm hoping that the communication of items that are going to be approved under delegated authority could be communicated to us prior to the, the approvals, just so councillors are aware of what's going on in their community, in their ward. Um, we, we are expected to know uh, what issues are arising as far as planning matters and if we can be informed ahead of time. I know there's a risk that people may want to get more than enough information and, and may bog the process down, but I'm hoping that's not the case, but I feel we need a communication strategy to go with this. Those are my comments. Thank you. Well, Madam Clerk, um, did you have something else? <coughs> That Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just wanted to say I'd be happy to second. I, I'm assuming that um, Councillor Markison was actually proposing an amendment to the draft bylaw, and I'd be happy yeah, to second. Yeah, I'll, I'll make that a, a proposed amendment yeah, to okay. the bylaw. I'll be the seconder for that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, we'll hear from Councillor Maynard. So. That one's on the on the floor, so I have something else. But I, um, I just maybe we can hear. I'd like to hear from the CEO how she um, proposes to keep us uh, to keep us abreast of the uh, of um, whatever files may be considered for delegation. Because as we transition into this new new format, I mean, it's going to be different for for us as council, but it's also going to be quite different for the public so that we have that uh, transparency you know we can kind of get help us help you get a feel of uh, what it is that is most important to uh, both to the applicants and to the to the public at large so, so how you would you see that speaking uh, to a communications outbound? yes well okay. uh, how how are you going to transmit the information prior to a delegation so that we get a good sense of uh, what is uh, so. what's happening in the plan so so um, uh, through your worship so that was not the bylaw wording we brought to the table tonight so I'm mm -hmm. going to speculate because we haven't had that conversation about how we would apply the um, amendment that um, is being proposed but um, I think that it would um, it would have to be that the uh, director of the department would um, uh, 
communicate with all of council that this, uh, you know, maybe with some kind of set 17, uh, seven day notice or something that this is um, a, a delegation that is about to be issued. Um, but it, uh, I think that um, uh, the, in terms of how we saw this working with the public is similar to the, the way the delegation of authority uh, that has been exercised is showing up as a item mm -hmm. um, with the reports um, coming to council here. We would uh, continue with the same process to make sure there's some transparency and due diligence that the technical planning work was done and not just uh, authority was exercised. So I, I foresee some similar way. It would. For the public, it would be a little bit of lag time because yeah. uh, we would have that occur um, at council as they come. So they you know that could have been anything decided within that two-week period. But operationally, we'd have to um, figure some way of providing notice. I think the the notice to council would be not transparent to the public, but would be allowing council to know that a decision is being made. Um, I I'm not totally sure I understand that other than uh, it gives council the opportunity to then um, uh, bring the matter before council to suggest that uh, to bring it for a vote so that it to see if a majority vote could remove it from delegation of authority um, so we'd have to give enough notice uh, if that's the intention of that um, uh, bylaw change and just for just for clarification so where it says notwithstanding that we that uh, something could be brought forward, either it could be brought forward by maybe by the applicant or by council. Why would we necessarily need a? It's kind of like a notice. Why would we need a majority vote of of council if we deemed it as something that we thought would be in the public interest to to discuss? And, I'm, who are you addressing just, the, the question to? Well, still to the to the CAO. I guess I'm kind of looking at Councillor Margotson. Well, because I'm trying to just trying to get my head wrapped. If, if I can okay. speak to that, okay. I, I think my my communication strategy part that I I addressed was making council aware of the planning matters that are being. Um, reviewed through the delegated authority before we get a summary that they've been approved. And there is risks associated that, with that because that may um, prompt uh, premature or, or hasty uh, decisions for it to come to council and I'm hoping that's not the case but as a councillor I personally would like to know what's happening in my ward before I see it that it's been approved under delegated authority. So I was just looking for a mechanism to, to understand what is being reviewed by our planning department under the delegated authority before it gets approved. So right now we get that summary at our council meeting but we don't, we don't know that that's happening until we get that summary. Does that make sense? To yes. Yeah, okay. Councilor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for answering the, my first set of questions. So, but I, I have just hearing, yeah, just hearing the talk, and, um, and because it's not really explained in the bylaw, I'm wondering if, if we should just refer this back to staff to bring it back to us, so that there's some communication in there. Um, so that we understand how the process is going to work instead of doing it on the fly. You, so you're talking about what, what Councillor Margotson is proposing? Well, if, if we're going to make a change, but now the, the conversation is how do we get notified? And from what I'm hearing, we're not sure how that's going to happen yet. And before for myself, I don't feel comfortable passing it without knowing what the process is, I guess. And the, the concern is, you know, council should know what's going on in their ward, but how do we get notified? So that's kind of what I'm looking at. So just refer it back to staff to bring that part of it back as part of the bylaw. 
Okay, but well, let, let's see what Madam CAO may have in mind. So I, I don't think that would be written into the bylaw. Um, uh, I, I will say that other municipalities um, have uh, more transparency, some municipalities have more transparency about what are active files that the municipality is working on generally, whether they go to council or their delegated authority, by ward, by uh, address, you can just find out what is uh, before the planning department. Some have more sophisticated systems that tell you where in the process that application is. It's a complete submission, it's under review. It's, we do not have that kind of electronic tracking system, but that is certainly um, a goal to aspire to. So I think that uh, over time we would work to try and be more transparent overall. I think the increased uh, attention to notice, signage, the, um, the have your say um, site that we're trying to uh, leverage so there's more awareness about the files that are coming before council um, uh, and, and before the, the municipality for consideration I think is part of uh, the efforts in that way. I think what we're talking about here is is um, a courtesy awareness for councils so that the you're not waiting till the next council meeting agenda got posted to know that a, a decision is about to, uh, that it was made. Um, we certainly can operationally figure out what's the best way to do that, but I think that uh, regardless of how we operationalize notice for council, uh, that would not be written into the wording of the bylaw. Okay. Councilor Margotson. Thank you. Yeah. So that's, I just wanted to say to Madam CAO, that's exactly what I was envisioned. I didn't want to amend the bylaw to include that, but I thought it was an important part of this going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just want to say I support the the notion of delegated authority and the the the, um, the hope that it would improve our efficiency and and not help us with our meetings in terms of getting bogged down with, with issues and, and items that are best left with technical planners or engineers. So, and the suggestions I made, I hope they, they're, they're not meant to be, you know, council overseeing staff any more than we already are, but I just felt that they were important. And the one was just to increase the number of delegated authority for larger residential. So that's it for me, thank you. Okay. So, Madam Clerk, any other questions? Councilor Maynard. Well, that correction to staff. Was regarding the notwithstanding clause. We I Madam amended Clerk? the bylaw, but the communications part is not what I. It wasn't part of amending the bylaw. Wait a yes. sec. Let, let's let Madam Clerk yeah. in here. So there still is. Okay. Good. Through your worship, so we're talking about clause 097. Yeah. So the amending motion would read as follows. So it's pa it's moved by Councilor Margaretson, seconded by Councilor Hirsch. That motion CW-097-2020 be amended to read as follows. That the bylaw presented to council for enactum, enactment on June 23rd, 2020, in order to consolidate planning delegation of powers and duties of council, clause 1D be amended to include site plan control approval and site plan control agreements for minor development, and that clause 3C of the bylaw be amended to include all of the provisions of clause 1. That's what I have so far. And we did, we do have copies of the bylaw with this amendment. It just does not include the provision of um, clause C saying that it be amended to include all of the provisions of clause one for council. So I can pass it around. Yeah, instead of development, it was a matter. Yep. That so I changed, changed two things from 1D <clears throat> to 1 and then the word develop any development to any matter may be referred back because clause one in the bylaws referred to as matters not developments so it would read that do this council clause one be amended to include any matters yes yep Can 
Can you read that again, Madam Clerk? Sure. Amen. So that motion CW-097-2020 be amended to read as follows. That council receive report, well, this will be the whole motion as amended, so I'm just gonna read the amendments. That the bylaw presented to council for enactment on June 23rd, 2020, in order to consolidate planning delegation of powers and duties of council, clause one be amended to, be amended to include any matters and that clause three C of the bylaw be amended to include all of the provisions of clause one. Can I speak that, to that please? Yeah. Yep. So if you added in residential developments as part of a plan, plans of subdivision and condominium as a definition of minor development, did you do that RCU? Or? I don't believe that's that's why I'm making no. faces. I don't believe that's written. I think no, if, no. if we benefit from uh, five minutes to just get the wording right. So, but, so that was an addition yes. to a minor development definition. Yes. There's no addition. There's no amendment to clause one. There's an addition of in number two, a definition of minor development being a residential development that's part of a plan of subdivision or plan of condominium. That's and then number two, three, one D changes, you just eliminate D, and then a develop, de the word development becomes matter. And that's it, those are the revisions. That's the only revisions. Okay, can we take five minutes to allow, do you need and five then we minutes to get this started? a written version so yeah. that everyone can see what, they're, what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. You got revised wording? So that motion CW097-2020 be amended to read as follows. That the bylaw presented to council for enactment on June 23rd, 2020 in order to consolidate planning delegation of powers and duties of council, clause 2C be deleted in its entirety and replaced with the following. C, low density residential developments with 10 units or less or residential development associated with blocks on an approved plan of subdivision or plan of condominium. And that clause three be deleted in its entirety and replaced with the following. Notwithstanding the provisions of one of this bylaw, a matter may be referred back or requested to be referred back to council as provi provided in this bylaw through clauses one A to C. Okay. Is that the mover and a seconder in agreement with that? Okay. Councilor Nyman? I just want to make sure I, I'm understanding. So the other points that Councilor Margeson brought up about notifying council and um, if council, any member of council wanted to bring something back, where does that fit in here? We're, it, it, are we reading it in the motion or it's, it's not going to go in the bylaw but I just want to make sure it, it's in there so that Man, I believe that's in the language isn't it 
through you, Madam Mr. Clerk. Mayor, um, that right of counsel to be able to do that is in the bylaw under clause C of the notwithstanding, the number three. It says that the provisions of this bylaw may be referred back or requested to be referred back to council as provided in this bylaw. So that that clause ensures that that right is, is there and then the CAO and uh, the experts will decide how that will occur right. operationally. Okay. Okay, Councilor Mayor. Well, I just, except for the last statement, the experts and the CAO will determine how that happens. My understanding was if somebody, if a member of council asked for it, then it would come back to the planning committee without, it's automatic comes back to the planning committee. There's no discussion. Is that what I'm, or did I misunderstand it wrong? I think that is the gist of what is included in Councillor Margotson's language as read. Madam CAO. Uh, through your worship, so matters that under the Planning Act require uh, public consultation, council will see them at planning committee before a decision is made because the terms of reference you approved earlier this evening would require that the um, matter go to a statutory public meeting before any decision can be made. So that would be notice for those that and, and very public notice for anybody interested in a particular plan, planning file where it is mandated by the Planning Act to consult first. There are some decisions in this list, like the removing of the holding zone uh, H status or part lock control or other kinds of things that the Planning Act uh, doesn't require the public consultation on. Uh, so in order to uh, affect the um, uh, intent that Councillor um, Margaretson was talking about, we'll, ha we'll have to operationally uh, find a way to uh, alert Council that we are making those decisions that wouldn't normally go to a public meeting uh, before the decision is made so that you're aware of them before, um, before th th that is actually happening uh, in the community. So we'll, we'll figure out um, a good way to do that. Um, without burdening everyone. Um, uh, but but the, the majority of the decision, the bigger decisions would, that are under this delegation of authority would, uh, you would see because of the public meeting and planning committee. Okay. All right, other questions? <clears throat> Councillor McNaughton. So uh, regarding the communications aspect that you've just outlined, so conceivably we are moving towards a more transparent process in general that would be more transparent for the public and councillors. Down the road, if, if we go forward with this tonight, down the road, uh, is, is that transparency a goal so that it could essentially nullify this sort of overview that we would need to receive? Or would that, uh, is this a goal? Increased transparency. MCAL. Uh, through your worship, so absolutely increased transparency is one of the goals here. Uh, I think that um, increased consultation and more meaningful consultation is part of that. Uh, and I think that um, we, we will continue to look for ways to um, help the community be able to see what decisions are, are made. Uh, as I said, some municipalities ha keep lists of active files uh, on a public website so that you can uh, know what is um, currently before and how long files move through the system and that those kinds of performance metrics and I see us moving into that in the future. I, I think we still have a little more homework to do in the planning space as well as others before we get there but certainly that could be one of our objectives. Councillor St. Jean. Oh well, we'll follow up. <laughs> Along the same lines as, as Councillor Nyman, uh, with regards to 3C, uh, any member of council by way of written request of the Director of Development Services, the notwithstanding clause, doesn't that give an awful lot of authority to, to uh, overrule the CAO to any, any one of us? Or am I misunderstanding that? I, I'd like some clarity on that and that process. Okay, Madam CAO. Uh, through your worship, that's exactly what that clause does. Yes. So the idea is council's giving delegated authority for a bunch of matters, but any councillor could change their mind about that 
on a particular matter if they feel that that's necessary. That's, that is what that clause would achieve. So essentially a, a council member will, you know, we're giving you, would be giving you delegated authority on all these matters, but essentially I as a councillor could say, no, I disagree with you, Madam CAO, and I want that in front of council. That's correct. That's an awful lot of authority to give vest mm -hmm. in any one of us at any one time that has the potential to be misused. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully it won't be misused and it will be used judiciously because ultimately the goal in the review of this process has been to you know increase transparency much greater public input which i'm fully in favor of um, and a speedier process that it can't be bogged down we hope i would hope it wouldn't be bogged down by by wanting to send everything back for for review that, that's my thought and i don't think that's the intent of what Councillor Margotson is proposing here. So okay. I hope it would be used yeah, responsibly, but it's a, it, it's a tool. I think it's, it's appropriate the way Councillor Margotson has phrased it to, um, you know, enable that, that uh, you know, that review if, if a member of council feels it's germane to their particular area of responsibility or, or to the municipality as a whole. Okay, that's that's what I was looking for. I just wanted a little more clarity on that uh, because I, I generally have that concern where, where council members, uh, and, and I'm not saying any one of us has done it or will do it, but there is that potential for council members to overstep our bounds and dive into administrative duties, and I really abhor that process. So thank you. Great. Sorry, did I not notice you with a follow-up maybe well <laughs> yeah yes or no uh, you did but you know what I've moved on it's okay but You're thank off. you okay uh, I can ask the question another time <laughs> and, you know anybody else before we move this to uh, a vote Councillor Bolick thank you mr. mayor um, while we're looking at this Paragraph one, the delegation itself. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry? We should vote on the amendment first. Yeah, it does, through you, Council Bullock, does your question refer to the no, amendment? No, it, it refers to the main motion, so should, we should deal with the amendment yeah. first. Yeah, we've got, we've got to deal with the amendment first. Okay, so we'll call the vote on the amendment, Madam Clerk. Do you want to read it one more time, please? I know it's long, but... That motion, CW-097-2020, be amended to read as follows. That the bylaw presented to Council for enactment on June 23rd, 2020, in order to consolidate planning delegation of powers and duties of Council, Clause 2C, be deleted in its entirety and replaced with the following. C low density residential developments with 10 units or less or residential developments associated with blocks on, a, on an approved plan of subdivision or plan of condominium. And that clause three be deleted in its entirety and replaced with the following. Notwithstanding the provisions of one of this bylaw, a matter may be referred back or requested to be referred back to council mm -hmm. as provided for in this bylaw through A to C. Okay, thank you everybody clear. Okay, I'll call, call the vote. All those in favor? Hands up, please. And that carries. That puts us back to the uh, the main motion. I'm losing my place here. Okay, Councillor Bolick, you had. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So it says here that the chief administrative officer and or the director of development series be delegated the authority. I have an aversion to the term and slash or because you're combining a conjunctive and a disjunctive word that are generally mutually exclusive. I know people use it all the time, but in legalese, it's problematic. 
Um, when you're delegating an authority, there is one authority that's held by council, and we delegate it to one person, not two people at the same time, because then the question is, do those people have to agree? Do they each make decisions on their own? Does one override the other? So to avoid that, I would suggest we change the wording that delegates the authority of council to the chief administrative officer, who may then further delegate that to the Directorate of Development. That keeps it neat and tidy from a legal viewpoint. Well, I agree with the Councillor Bullock. I hate and or too. Okay. So what, so yeah, that, I mean, that doesn't change the, the, uh, the gist of, of this bylaw, but it no. does make the chain very clear that we are delegating um, to one person and that that person may further delegate that power. Okay. However, we want to word that, Madam Clerk. Okay. So, through your worship, that's more of an administrative exactly. irregularity, so it doesn't change the intent, as you said, Councillor Bullock. So, why don't I make a note in the minutes that the and or Director of Development Services will be removed from the bylaw, and what will actually be passed will be the delegation of authority just to the CAO. With, a, with a power to her to further delegate to the Director of Development Services. So you can make that amendment to the language? So through your worship, it won't be an official amendment. It'll just be noted in the minutes, and I will take that and do it on the bylaw. Okay, that's fine. So we've got, where are we? Oh, Councillor Maynard, sorry. <clears throat> and I know it's getting, it's getting kind of late, but yeah. uh, I'm, I'm happy that we are, um, you know, I'm comfortable now that we're, we're going down this road. It's a pretty significant change to how we, um, how we conduct business and planning. And I would just, on that vein, I think that it's prudent that, um, that we, have a have a review clause in there so I would like to and I've given the clerk a copy of this I would like to on um, on page so it's right to, on the motion on page 149 sorry I've been flipping myself here a little bit um, so that the motion that we add to that motion uh, clause 4 that staff provide a review within one year as to the effectiveness of the consolidation of planning delegation of powers and duties of council and its goal to provide an improved public planning process. And that will just allow us to, and it's within a year, if uh, deemed that you want to bring it sooner, you can, but that will just give us a, a review of how, uh, how this uh, new planning process is uh, is working for for us as council and for the public and for the applicants. Okay, so we're we do want to fit this in into into. So I motion? It, it would just be a new it would be a a new clause. So we now under motion CW zero nine seven twenty twenty we have clause one two and three and I propose this as a uh, okay, clause Clerk. four. Okay. Through your worship, um, because the first amending motion amended clause two, this would become clause five. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. We just need a seconder. Need seconder. Councillor Hirsch. <laughs> okay, so that's that's clause five. So are we ready to vote on this? Okay, all those in favor, hands up please. And that carries, thank you. And so that moves us to item. Nope, through your worship, Sorry. now you'll have to vote on motion CW uh, 
097-2020 as amended. So I'll need a mover yeah. and a seconder. Councilor Maynard and Councilor McNaughton. All those in favor? That carries. Okay, now we're on to 10.2. Could I have a mover and a seconder for this one, please? Councilor Margotson. We're on 11. I'm sorry? We're on 11. Uh, sorry, 11 bylaws for consideration yet. It is getting late. Okay, if we could have a mover and a seconder for that, please. Councilor St. Jean, seconded by Councilor McNaughton. Could read those, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the following bylaws are recommended for adoption that the following bylaws be read. A first, sorry, a St. Jean McNaughton motion that the by following bylaws be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. 11.1.1, a bylaw to appoint bylaw enforcement officers for the Corporation of the County of Prince Edward. 11.1.2, excuse me, a bylaw to amend bylaw 4249-2018, being a bylaw to regulate and control parking lots on municipal property under the jurisdiction of the municipality and on private property. 11.1.3, a bylaw to amend bylaw 3167-2012 to delegate council's authority to chief administrative officer and or director of <laughs> development <laughs> services for planning matters. That was for Councillor Bollock's benefit. <laughs> okay, I'll look. Wait. Question, Councillor Prinson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to make an amendment to the bylaw 11 Point one, point two, um, the bylaw to uh, f amend forty four, forty nine, parking. for Bloomfield the two hour parking restrictions, and if I get a seconder, I'd like to amend that on uh, page one fifty four, schedule nine B Bloomfield parking restrictions two hour parking restrictions schedule. I'd like to change it from Monday to Friday to Monday to Sunday. Uh, the, this is coming from Baba. There are very concerned about the weekend, so two hour parking on the weekends would be um, really instrumental. So I would like to change that if I can get a seconder to change it from Monday to Sunday. Okay, Councilor Nyman is seconding. Yeah. Okay. So what would that motion look like? So through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I just for procedural and for the minutes so that they um, somebody can read them. Why don't we vote on 11.1.1 and 11.1.3 yep. and then do a motion for 11.1.2. Okay. Okay. So St. Jean McNaughton. Sure. Speaking to. Yeah, just, just for clarification. So because we've now made changes that affect um, the 11.1.3, do we just put as amended? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we're voting on it. Everybody clear on that? One and three. Sorry? To your worship, we're voting on 11.1.1 .1 and 11.1.3, St. Saint, um, Saint Jean McNaughton motion. As amended. Yes. Okay, all, all those in favor? That carries. Thank you. And then we need this move forward by Councillor um, Prinzen Nyman. Need a seconder. Seconder is Councillor Nyman. Correct. And the motion. That bylaw 11.1.2 be amended to read as follows. <laughs> Sorry, to reflect to read as follows. To <laughs> okay, that bylaw 11.1.2 be amended to reflect two hour parking Monday to Sunday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And that the bylaw be uh, approved as amended. Okay, that okay with mover and seconder? Yeah. Okay, questions? So we'll vote on question? Yeah, just a quick one. I don't think I've ever seen us do this before in this section of the the meeting is make a change to the bylaw right about at the same time. I don't have a problem with it. I've just never seen us do it before at this time. I don't know that I have either, but I think it's reasonable to do it. Let's call the vote. 
<laughs> All those in favor? That carries. Okay. I just hope we're not setting up ourselves for something <laughs> in the future here. We, that's, that's a pretty quick. We need a motion to extend. Past three hours. Kind of a mover right. a sector, and then we're going to whip through the rest. Councillor uh, Nyman, seconded by Councillor Hirsch. All those in favor? That carries. Okay. So that moves us into the uh, closed session. We have to move so into the first. Let me know when we're unwired. We need a mover and seconder to move in to close before I turn off the camera. Yeah, the, the Councillor uh, Margotson and Councillor Bolick, if you could read that. Councillor Margotson. Motion that council now move into closed session. Thank that you. Is that good? All those in favor? That carries. Okay. Okay. All right, so we're um, back in open session. So we are moving to item 13. Could I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? Not everybody at once. Councilor Nyman and Councilor Harper. Can you read that, please? It's a <clears throat> Nyman Harper mo motion that the council minutes from the closed session meeting held June 9th, 2020 be adopted. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? That carries. Thank you. Motions arising from closed session. We need a, a mover and the seconder. It, who are the movers and seconders? Margaret and Harper. I can read it out loud. Okay, why don't why don't you read it in Councillor Margotson's <laughs> Margotson Harper motion, please read it. That council directs staff to enter into an agreement with the Prince Edward County Affordable Housing Corporation for the transfer of land identified by roll number one three five zero two two four zero one zero one three zero zero. 230 Nile Street, Wellington, and that subject to Council's review of the terms and conditions of the transfer agreement for surplus municipal land between the Corporation, Corporation of the County of Prince Edward and the Prince Edward County Affordable Housing Corporation, staff be directed to bring forward a bylaw to authorize the transfer of the parcel of land. Thank you. All those in favor? And that carries. One. Okay. On to the confirmatory bylaw. Mover and a seconder for this, please. Councillor Maynard, seconded by Councillor Prinzen. Thank Re you, Worship. Uh, Maynard Prinzen, motion that the following bylaw be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. A bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council, the Corporation of the County of Prince Edward, at the meeting held on June 23, 2020. Thank you. All those in favor? And that carries. And motion to adjourn. Councillor Bolick. Seconded by Councillor Bailey. This is a whole Bailey at PM. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks a lot, Catalina.